Ladies, gentlemen, family, friends, neighbors, we welcome you to the Jewish Senior Theater Ensemble's premier Zoom performance. Theater can happen anywhere. And as a culture, we are moving into an exciting new time of theatrical styles. We are asked to think out of the box and discover new elements of storytelling with this approach. We are not in a darkened theater. We are in our homes. The actors are not 20 to 80 feet away from us, but close by on a screen. Our sets and scenery have become widely diverse choices of virtual backgrounds, photographs, paintings. Through the marriage of technology and art, a powerful script, and the interpretation by our actors, we find the familiar again. The dramatic tension and emotional force of great literature impacts us and we respond. Along with audiences everywhere, we watch as the power of expression carries us into a world of the imaginary. During the end of the 19th century, in a comfortable suburb of Paris, France, we meet the Wassels, Monsieur Charles and Madame Mathilde. Every marriage is unique in its own way, and in our story, we have an inside look at the unusual fate that befalls the Wassel household. Our original adaptation develops and expands upon the short story, The Necklace by Guy de Maupassant. This popular story has endured the test of time and stands out as an exceptional piece of historic French literature. It is a classic. The opening scene of this play takes us to the parlor of Madame Jean Forestier, furnished in the typical style of the French aristocracy of the day. Her old friend, Madame Mathilde Boissel, is visiting with her, and they are engaged in a friendly conversation. <laughs> oh, you look so pretty with your hair up off your neck that way, Mathilde. Why this hairstyle? Something I just threw together at the last minute. No, really? You had your lady's maid arrange it for you. Tell the truth. <laughs> Jean, how fortunate it is that you found time in your calendar to see me today. Oh, well, for an old friend from our school days at the convent, of course, I always find the time. I love visiting you here, with you here in the parlor. Why, it's so elegant. <laughs> oh, it's nothing. A little here, a little there. Thank you, my dear. The furniture is so large, the color is so rich, uh, with velvet, velvet everywhere. Oh, come now, you've been in my drawing room before? Of course. I am just admiring your decor, your silk curtains and wallpaper. <laughs> they look like you borrowed them from King Louis himself. Oh, how charming you are with your flattering words. Actually, the curtains and wallpaper were imported from the Orient. Hey, hmm, I must be careful. This wine is so tasty. Uh, not just wine, my dear, but port wine. Etienne brings it from Portugal. Nothing but the best port comes from Portugal. You're so right. Together with the macarons, my mouth is full of sweetness. Oh, Mathilde, dear, I do wish we could see each other more often. You are such good company and cheer me with your clever words. Perhaps we could visit the salon in Paris together. Um, well, of course I would love to, but I am so busy with my charity work and social obligations. Oh, well, may I call upon you instead? Oh, no, that would never do. Charles has set out rules how to occupy my time. Oh, well, our husbands know what we want. Yes, just to pass some time together? Um, I doubt if he would allow me to entertain during the day. Oh, I understand. Men can be so, well, <laughs> unreasonable. <laughs> yes, I guess you're right, John. John and Matilda very much enjoy an occasional visit together. However, when Mathilde leaves the Forestier's elaborate parlor, she begins to grieve. She resents that her life is so common and ordinary compared to the extravagant life of her friend. Heartsick by her low status in society, and the dreariness of her everyday life, Mathilde vows never to return. Scene two takes us to the modest home of Monsieur and Madame Moselle. We discover Mathilde and Adele who is their servant, cook, scullery maid, and housekeeper. The two of them are discussing the evening meal. Am I preparing scotch broth again tonight, madame? And why not? It is our dinner of all dinners every night, is it not? 
We have turnips, potatoes, and a bag of scraps. Yes, and soak the bread in it, Adele, while it is hot. Yes, ma'am. Oh, my. If only we had something better for my poor Charles. Pardon? I go make the stew now. Unless, of course, we have pheasant roast. Um, and, and, and possibly uh, for dessert, a pastry with uh, slices of apricot. Oh, oh, Madame, Madame, please. You are sad. Madame, what you want of me? Uh, no, no, Adele. Please, please go to the fire. I'll be there soon. Go, go on now. Do not pay any more attention to me. Yes, ma'am. Right away, ma'am. No, but wait, Adele, wait, please. Come over here by me. That's good. Now, could you ever, do you not ever dream of stiff iron tablecloths, dishes of porcelain, cognac, cheese? No, madame, no understand. So sorry, what is matter? Oh, oh. oh, no, no, everything is fine. You may go. I go to the fire, yes? Yes, go now. I will come to you soon. At the end of a long day, Charles Wassel, Mathilde's hardworking husband, arrives at home. He is employed at the Ministry of Education. Mathilde, Mathilde, come here, please. I have something for you. Oh, not now, Charles, please. Let us just sit down for dinner. Are you not hungry? Yes, and I am tired too. Much work I am given at Ministry. Yes, you are. Come sit down now. I should get rewards for my many hours of hard work. Ah, is it you again tonight, my dear? Yes, what else could I serve you? I'm afraid we eat like paupers. You deserve more when you come home so tired. You are kind for your concern, but this dish is my favorite meal. <laughs> this stew? <laughs> but it is as plain as this house. A simple, humble dish. What, you are not happy in our home? Yes, I am. It is just that our rooms are so sparse. What is wrong with the rooms? Well, they're small and barren. The walls are almost empty. The furniture worn and frayed. Meager. Imagine, if we had a gold-framed mirror, a brocade tapestry, and more portraits to cover the walls. Come now, Mathilde, this house keeps us warm from the cold and dry from the rain. Very suitable, I should think. Now stop your foolish talk and eat this good meal. Yes, I will eat. Just dreaming, I guess, as usual. We could be in much worse shape. Some of the dwellings I see walking through the streets, now those are truly dreadful. We are fortunate. Dear. Oh, I almost forgot. I have an envelope for you to open. What is it? I shall read it for you. <clears throat> the Minister of Education and Madame Georges Ropineau beg Monsieur and Madame Loiselle to do them the honor of attending an evening reception at the Ministerial Mansion on Friday, January 18th. Well, what good is that to me? My dear, I thought you'd be thrilled to death. You never get a chance to go out, and this is a regal affair, a wonderful one. I had an awful time getting an invitation. Everybody wants one. It's much sought after, and not many clerks have a chance at one. You will see all the most important people there. What do you think I have to go in? Why, the dress you wear when we go to the theater? That looks quite nice, I think. Oh. Oh. What, why, you are weeping. What's the matter? What's the trouble? Oh, nothing. Only I do not have an evening dress to wear. Therefore, I cannot go to that affair. Give the invitation to some other friend at the office whose wife has a finer wardrobe than I have. Oh, dear. All right, let's see. Mathilde, how much would a suitable outfit cost? One you could wear for other affairs, too? Something very simple. Mm, I'm not sure exactly, but I think with 400 francs, I could manage it. He has set aside just that amount to buy a hunting rifle for a weekend lark, shooting with friends in another town. If it will ease your distress, I'll give you 400 francs, but try to get a pretty dress. 
Oh, 400 francs? I could hire a seamstress to make a beautiful gown for that much money. Thank you, thank you so much. As the day of the party approaches, Matilde seems sad, moody, ill at ease. Her outfit is ready, however. Her beautiful gown was built especially for her, yet she remains distracted and unhappy. What is it, my dear? Is the gown not enough made for you in the style of the day? Gloves, shoes, fan, you will be the bell. Charles, how can I be a bell with a neck unadorned and naked? Come now, is that what's been the cause of your low spirit for the last three days? Are you not excited about going to the ball? It's embarrassing not to have a jewel or a gem, not to wear around my neck. I will look like a pauper. I would almost rather not go to the ball. Why not wear some flowers? They're very fashionable this season. For 10 francs, you can get two or three gorgeous roses. No, there's nothing more humiliating than to look poor among rich women. My, but you're silly. Why not visit your friend, Madame Forestier, and ask her to lend you some jewelry? Would that solve the problem? I had not thought of that. But Charles, I would be embarrassed to beg from her. No, 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 no. You and she have known each other for many years. She would be delighted to help out an old friend for a fancy ball at the ministerial mansion. Why, that may be the truth. We have known each other for so long, it may be a solution. Of course. Wonder, could I go? Yes, I will. Yes, I will do it. I will go tomorrow. The very next day, like an excited child, Mathilde rushes off to see Madame Jean Forestier. She is in full pursuit of her dream come true. Once again, in Jean's drawing room, we discover the two old friends engaged in an excited, high-spirited conversation. And you know, of course, that Charles and I have the honor of an invitation to the Ministerial Mansion Ball in January. Oh, that's Marvelous news. You are so fortunate, my dear Mathilde. You should see my gown. It is well resplendent. Pale blue colored, flowing layers to the floor. I wear very long gloves and pumps. I also carry in one hand my mother of pearl fan. Oh. But you see, I'm not sure yet. Well, it does sound gorgeous, but why is it that you hesitate? Well, my outfit is nearly complete, Jean, my friend, but mm, I'm still a little sad, I'm afraid. Well, why is that? How can I help? I have no jewel or necklace to wear with my gown. I will look out of place. Uh, oh, no. Well, we shall see about that. I will get my jewelry box, and you may choose one of mine to wear. I may choose one of yours? <laughs> oh, my, thank you. Sure, here, take a look. Mathilde looks eagerly through the black satin box with excitement. She tries on a multi-strand pearl necklace, a Venetian cross. However, she expresses to her friend that she is not satisfied. Have you met something else? Oh, yes. Keep on looking. I do not know what you wish to wear. Oh, this necklace? This is just what I need. It is so radiant, it gleams. Oh, look, my hands are trembling. Oh, indeed they are. Oh, it would be so wonderful if I could wear this. May I borrow it, just this and nothing else? Yes, of course. Come, look in the mirror with me, Jean. I am imagining what I will look like wearing diamonds with my gown. Yes, I see. You will be glowing, my friend. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I will be so proud to wear your diamond necklace around my neck. <laughs> oh, wonderful, Mathilde. I will never forget you. <laughs> Your generosity, never. It is January, and the day of the midwinter ball approaches. Popular during the Victorian era, balls were magnificent gatherings of elegant and richly dressed men and women. On the evening of the ball, Monsieur and Madame Moussel arrive at the mansion in a proper, handsome carriage. Matilde, however, come with her fantasies, rushes toward the bright lights. 
look at all of this, Charles. I would not have believed it if I was not here myself. Yes, shall we join the others in the ministry? Oh yes, let us go in. But I need to be so careful walking in these new pumps. Ah, all the brightly lit candles and oil lamps, the large chandelier. Oh, Charles, what do you think? Isn't it marvelous? Yes, indeed. I will put up our wraps. I shall move in with the other women too, so they can admire my gown. By now, Matilda's joined the others on the dance floor. The eager gentlemen guests stand by, watching her enthusiastically, ardently. Every time the orchestra stops, these men rush toward her, asking her to agree to the next waltz. She dances madly, delirious with pleasure, giving no thought to anything in the triumph of her beauty and success. Now we notice two slightly older women standing off to the side. They are looking at Matilde with envy. One woman is fanning herself furiously. They stare obtrusively at the astonishing woman. We will listen to their conversation. Who is she? I demand to know who that foozler is. A clumsy foozler, I dare say, the way she dances so recklessly and chatters with the all-important guests. Why, Patrice, she acts like a trollop. Oh, Charlotte, come now. Do not wag that vulgar tongue so. Do you not see that she is not one of us? A hornswoggler she is indeed. A fraud. Huh, and how is it that you know that? <laughs> Just look at her ankles, Charlotte. I can always tell the lowly women among us. I see that her ankles are wide, too wide to qualify. Oh, I dare say, yes, they are unfashionably wide. Oh, I cannot bring myself to look at them any longer, poor thing. <laughs> <gasps> Why, I know who she is, that simple little Mathilde Loiselle, Charles Loiselle's wife. She's unmistakable. I recognize those ankles. <laughs> Why, yes, I believe you were right. That's Matilde. The minister must have invited her out of sympathy. That is the only reason why she was invited. You know, Patrice, that her husband works in the pink workforce? I dare say a clerk in an office. Oh, you are right, Charlotte. Monsieur Loisel works at the ministry for my husband. <clears throat> the distinguished Monsieur Georges Ropineau. Your husband is Charles Loiselle's superior? Yes, indeed, Charlotte. Loiselle works all day long, bending over the books. He accounts for the business of the ministry. I dare say Georges felt obliged to invite the Loiselles. They are so pitiful, and the man longed so for an invitation. <laughs> Just look at her showing off. I would feel embarrassed to have all those men looking so amorously at me. How pathetic they all are. They must not see her ankles. Oh, look how she twirls and spins around waltzing like she is the prettiest, most admired woman in the room. Oh, you mean the most desired woman in the room? Oh, how hmm. wicked your tongue. A real tattler you are. Oh, not a gossip. Not I. I nearly tell the truth. There, even the cabinet officials beg to waltz with her. Ah, I dare say there's our minister himself, bowing and speaking with her. <laughs> Why, that is my George, my very foolish husband. Well, I shall put an end to that. He shall hear from me. How dare he mingle with such a common woman? Excuse me, Charlotte. <laughs> Madame Ropineau runs off to scold her husband. <laughs> while Madame Soleil follows in her wake, oh. smiling to herself. Ordinarily, at this point, we would take a short intermission. Since we are all at home, take a few minutes for yourselves, and we will return in five minutes.
As the hour grows late, the ministry ballroom quiets down. Candles are dimmed. The orchestra has begun to pack their instruments. Remaining members of the crowd are leaving for home. Matilde reluctantly goes to find her husband, who is sleeping on one of the valet sofas by the door. Charles, Charles, wake up now. It is time to leave. Come on now, let us hurry away. Oh, hello there, dear. What time is it? It is very late. We must go. We cannot stop now. Wait, wait, Mathilde. What about your shawl? It is very cold. It is not a shawl. It is a drab wrap. Now, follow me. We must go into the darkness now. Come, Charles. Hold on. You will certainly make yourself sick. Slow down, Mathilde. What is the matter with you? Come over here this way, Charles. Put this shawl on your shoulders. It is cold outside. Oh, fine. I will take that old wrap now. We can no longer be seen by the others. Here, over your shoulders. There we go. That is better now. Oh, will we ever find a cab? We are already halfway down to the docks. There is no, there's sure to be one of those shabby nighttime carriages here by the Seine. I am tired and I have to be back at the ministry so early in the morning. Any kind of ride will do. Finally, they call over a passing carriage that takes them to their home in the Rue de Martyr in the outskirts of Paris. They climb wearily up to their apartment. Matilda looks in the mirror to admire herself once again as she removes her shawl. Oh no! What's the trouble? Come on, I do not have Madame Forestier's necklace. What do you mean I do not have? That is not possible. Look through the folds of your dress, your cloak, the pockets. I am, and it's nowhere to be seen. Look on the floor, the stairs, by the door. Are you sure you had it when leaving the dance? Yes, I felt it when I was in the hall of the ministry. But if you had lost it on the street, we'd have heard it drop. It must be in the cab. Yes, quite likely. But which cab was it? Did you happen to get its number? No, you did not notice it either. No. I'll retrace our steps on foot. See if I can find it. Are you, are you going to leave me here? May I go with you? No, no, you may not. You are very upset. Now sit down, Mathilde, and pull yourself together. I will be thorough. You may be waiting a long time. Mat I think I may faint. Come back soon. That evening, Monsieur Wassel returns from work after searching for the necklace all night and then going to the ministry to work. He is pale, his face lined. Mathilde has not slept. She has not even moved from the chair. She rises slowly, carefully, dreading the next few moments. The expression on her husband's face, the heaviness of his steps coming up the stairs does not bode well. Yes, Charles, come and sit down. You were gone all night and all day at work. What have you been doing? I'm afraid that I do not have good news. What about the necklace? I have gone to the police, the cab companies, and put a notice in the newspaper. If we offer a reward, perhaps someone will turn it in. Oh dear, all is lost. What do we know now? You will have to go to your friend and tell her the whole story. It is time to tell Jean Forestier. Oh no, I, ca I can't do that. I could never do that. It would be too humiliating. What does that matter? We have no choice. Oh no, no, never. Please, Charles, do not force me to do that. It is time to tell her the truth. You are old friends. Madame Forestier will understand and forgive. No, tell me what to say and I'll write her a letter. I will explain that the latch broke and I need to have it replaced. I cannot consent to this. I see no other way. Please, a letter will give us more time to find the necklace, don't you see? Oh, foolishness. Come, Charles, dictate a letter to me. You are so good with words. As the days pass, the Wessels continue to ask for help, check the progress of their ads, retrace steps. They are desperate to find the missing necklace. It is becoming more and more evident that the necklace is never to be found. At the end of the week, they have given up all hope. Well, this is a very sad and difficult place in which to find ourselves. I see only one choice before us now. Agree. We must replace the necklace. Replace? Replace it? I am nothing but a minor clerk. I cannot afford to buy a replacement for a diamond necklace. 
You have the money inherited from your father, and perhaps we can borrow the rest. You know very well that the bank will only loan money to the property owners among us. And of course, that does not include those who labor for a living. We will both go to Madame Forcier. That is the reasonable solution. Otherwise, we face financial ruin. Never, Charles, never. We will replace the necklace. She will never have to know. My foolish wife, what a burden you are, but you are the wife I love. All right, we shall replace it. I don't know how, but we'll replace it. Oh, Charles, I knew you would see it my way. Then let us go straight away to the shop where the necklace was sold. I will negotiate a price in case we can return it. Perhaps good fortune will be on our side. So the Wassells put on their finest clothes and set out to the jewelers. When they find the shop, they are alarmed by how fancy it looks. And the patrons going in and out doing business with this jeweler are dressed in furs and suits, appearing to be quite wealthy. However, this does not discourage Matilda because she is determined to have her way. The case for the necklace in hand, she boldly pushes her unwilling husband through the door to the shop. Well, a fine morning to you both. Come in, come in. Now, how might I be of help? We hope to replace a necklace that was bought here in your shop. Yes, a diamond necklace, but it was lost. Here, look inside the case in which it came. Your name is inscribed. Oh, really, no. Uh, may I see the case, please? Uh, no, just as I thought. I did sell that case, but it was for a different necklace, one that was purchased elsewhere, I'm afraid. Oh, no, but we have looked everywhere for that necklace in all the better shops and have not found it anywhere. I see. Uh, do you remember what the case, what it looked like? Yes, indeed. I remember it exactly. I even drew a likeness of it on this paper. Please, won't you look at it? Uh, indeed, I will. Why, this is drawn by a fine hand. I can see the I can see the shape and design clearly. If only we could find another just like it. It is terribly important. Uh, do you see that small workplace in the back? I'm also a goldsmith. Uh, would you like me to re replicate the necklace for you? It would be difficult, but I imagine that I could do it. How to do that? Uh, I'm a businessman. For the right price, I could create a crown for the Queen of England. And what would that right price be, may I ask? Uh, I'll give you a figure, but first I must consult my books. Will you excuse me for a moment? He looks down, pretending to go through his records, stealing sideway glances at the Wassells who are whispering in the corner. Come here, wife of mine. Yes? What are you thinking? We cannot pay this man. We must <laughs> leave here at once. I will not listen to you, Charles. We made a decision and we will stick to it. Now come with me. Uh, Monsieur and Madame, I can create a diamond necklace for you for 40,000 francs. Would you care to pay now or later? 40,000 francs, we cannot pay that. May we ask for a lower figure? What, you want to make a pauper out of me? I will say 36,000 and that's the lowest figure that I can present. I still find that necklace. If we pay you and then find it, would you be in a position to buy it back? Of course, for 32,000 francs, I would. Yes, I understand. You are a businessman. I'll tell you what. I'll give you till the end of February to find that necklace, but you must pay me, for, and then I'll take it back. You must pay me first. We shall return in three days with the money. As Charles and Mathilde walk home, they enter into a bit of a conflict. And how, may I ask, are we supposed to get 36,000 francs in three days, hmm, milady? But we agreed. Yes, I know, we agreed to replace the necklace, a diamond necklace, but 36,000 francs. How I dread borrowing the money. I have never even been in debt. Oh, I know, we are poor, we are nearly worthless, uh, but let us not focus on that for now. We can plan how to pay back our loans later. Let's just focus on borrowing the money. 
Yes, just not think about it. Reckless lady, I will go and sign my life away, beg on my knees, borrow wherever I can. We will pay for the necklace, Charles. We just have to. We have no other choice. Poor Charles Wassel is becoming weary of asking for banknotes from both friends as well as mere acquaintances in his field of work. A few hundred francs from one person, several hundred more from someone else. In desperation to raise the money, he visits his old friend, Francois. Oh, not I, Charles. You've known me for years now, so you know I'm as poor as you. Yet you come to me to ask for a loan. You know I still owe money to the user. I have not finished paying. I'll tell you what, just for an old friend, I can spare eight francs. It's not much, but you will need to pay me back double the interest. Those are the terms. Understood? Double the interest. Like a beggar asking for scraps of food, he appeals to a supervisor, Monsieur Georges Rubineau. Yes, Moselle, you know quite well, I'm sure, that there's always more work to be done at the ministry. I do have work to complete that will earn you a few extra pennies. I need duplicate copies of all these documents, important correspondence and records. Can you do that for me in three days? There can be no errors, and I will pay you handsomely. Only, it must be completed by Monday morning, or all is forfeit. Monday morning. Finally, in his anguish, he seeks the rest from a well-known but disreputable moneylender, a trader who drives hard bargains and deals shrewdly. It is with fear and resignation that Monsieur Wassel takes on this risk. It is his last resort. <laughs> so you want a loan from me? <laughs> you know my terms, right? And the interest that I require in payments. <laughs> Have you ever done this kind of transaction before? No, no, you never, never, right? I require payment in full. Are we agreed? Just sign here on this document. Right here, that's right. Now, we are businessmen working together. A businessman always pays his debt. You understand? You will pay or there will be consequences, my little man. And we do not want consequences, do we? <laughs> Finally, after risking everything, terrified by the outlook for the future and the blackness of despair about to close around him, Monsieur Wassel goes to claim the new necklace from the jeweler as promised. Well, now, my dear, here is your precious necklace. Go now and return it to your old friend. After that, we will see some changes around here, I'm afraid. Embarrassed by the circumstances and to avoid being seen, Matilde returns the necklace to a servant at the door to Madame Forestier's home and then quickly departs. Thereafter, Charles and Matilde talk about the business of arranging their lives in a manner that will enable them to pay back the loans. You realize that, that even if we sell everything we own, we will only raise a few thousand francs. Sell? Sell all of our belongings? Furniture? Clothing? Shoes, linens, pots, pans, stove, yes, everything. Our total, absolute total worth is nowhere near 36,000 francs. I can work. It will take many more dreaded changes, Mathilde, many more. Let us sit down and plan out the next few years of our lives. It was not possible for the Wassels to hide their change in lifestyle. They were seen moving their meager belongings in crates and sacks to a much less desirable section of Paris. Matilda had to suffer the humiliation of selling her personal belongings and furniture in the public markets. Strangers grabbing her possessions. Fetching a good price was her cherished ball gown, fingered and tugged at by curious buyers. Everyone witnessing the Wassel's public disgrace begins to tattle and gossip among themselves about their unfortunate downfall. Now we discover Adele, the Wassell's maid who was with an acquaintance, a farm worker, Suzanne. The two of them are walking together in the street on their way out of the city. They too react to the Wassell's disgrace. And then I tell you, my Madame dismisses me, she does, without any way telling me before. No. Yes. I say, where do I sleep? What do I eat? And she say, you go Adele, I cannot help. 
And she'd say, I wash the floor. I make the fire. <laughs> and she would fall on her head. To be sure. <laughs> and then it all go. The eating pots, the chairs, table, bed. They need the banknotes and much of it. They moved to attic and garden and art. Up four stairways. Now, madame, does she cook? I do not know what. They have market, but you need many notes. Pay many notes for food. And she carries slop down to the street every day. Up and down, up and down. <laughs> she grow old every day. Poor oh, madame. Her life is like opera. Yes, but now about me. What do I do? Now we walk back to farm. You work the field with me. It will be good. But how, please? You tell me how. It'd be hard, my friend. We cut the field grass down and care for the animals. The back hurts at night, but we eat and sleep warm. I thank you, Suzanne. I am not a home anymore. We stay together, right? Oh, yes, right. I'm going to farm with my friend Suzanne. We walk to country. We walk together to new farm home. Come, we eat dinner tonight. Our two tattlers from the ball have their opinions, too. They enjoy waving their mean tongues against both Charles and Matilda. They are in their favorite salon, sipping tea with muffins and having a jolly good time. And you do know that Monsieur Loisel labors day and night trying to, uh, I don't know, he's got an evening job and paying off some notes apparently. By the light of a single candle, he copies pages from manuscripts for pennies a page. I dare say, Charlotte, he's grown old and seems to be a broken man. Charles always did what that headstrong wife wanted. And now look at him, pathetic little fool. I must say, I do pity them, even though they tried to step up out of their station. If they were not showing off so, perhaps nothing would have happened. Without any house servants, Mathilde scrubs floors, does laundry. She does dreadfully ugly work like a servant, does not dress properly anymore, her gray hair untidy, and shops in the street with the ruffians. She's turning peasant, I dare say, coarse and hard. Yes, Charlotte, my dear, you are so right. Oh my, just talking about all that servant work Wears me out. <laughs> mm, mm, aren't these muffins tasty? The Wassell slave mercilessly counting their pennies without the ordinary comforts that money provides. Yet sometimes Matilda sits near the window and thinks of that long ago evening at the ball when she had been so beautiful and admired. During these times, she wonders to herself, what would have happened if I had not lost that necklace? How fickle life is, just a moment from joy to misery. This difficult way of life continues for 10 years. Finally, at the end, the Wassels pay it all back, including the exorbitant rates of the loan sharks and accumulated compound interest. It is a heroic effort to raise the 36,000 francs, but they do it. On a Sunday morning in early May, Matilda goes for a walk on the Champs-Élysées to relax a bit from the week's labors. Down the way, she notices a woman strolling with a child. It is Madame Forestier. Matilda recognizes her old friend Jean, for she still looks young, still beautiful. Should she approach her and speak? Should she tell her the whole story now that everything is paid off? Why not? Good morning, Jean. But, madame, I don't recognize. You must be mistaken. No, Jean. Look at me again. I'm Mathilde Loiselle. What now? Oh, my poor Mathilde. How you've changed. Yes, I have had a hard time since last seeing you, and plenty of misfortunes, and all on account of you. What kind of me? How do you mean? Do you remember that diamond necklace that you loaned me to wear to the ball at the ministry? Yes. So what about it? Well, I lost it. You lost it, but you returned it. Yes, I brought you another just like it. Uh, and we've been paying for it for 10 years now. You can imagine that wasn't easy for us who had nothing. Well, it's over now, and I'm glad of it. 
you mean to say you bought a diamond necklace to replace mine? Ever noticed them? That is good. They were quite alike. Oh, my poor Matilde, but mine was just an imitation. Why, at most, it was worth only 500 francs. Oh, 